So good day, everyone. My name is Brian Proffitt with Red Hat's Open Source Program Office, welcoming you to another edition of Community Central. Before I introduce today's guests, we have the usual housekeeping notes. If you have questions for our presenter, please use the Q&A tool found on your screen. Ask the question. Um, the, for those of you who want to approve and like the question, go right ahead, because when we're done, we'll ask the questions in the order of most light. Um, so with that housekeeping out of the way, I'm very pleased to introduce Anna Dupliak, an in uh, software engineer with Red Hat, who is here today. Tell us about OptiPlanner. And Anna, welcome. Um, let me just start with sharing my screen. All right, take it away. Do you see it? Yes. Great. All right. So, welcome to introduction to the Output Planner Artificial Intelligence Constraint Solver. Today, we are going to discuss how uh, business decisions could be automated by artificial intelligence and open source. Let's talk about a little bit about what is exactly problems. Really. And uh, the first example could be a vehicle routing problem. In vehicle routing problem, we have set of customers, the set of vehicles, and a depot station. And beside of that, we have some Mm, constraints, rules we don't want to broke, like uh, capacity of the vehicle or the driving skill steps we, mm, we, that we rest for the time window when customer wants his products in a certain period of time. Some optional rules, like mm, if we want to minimize driving time, for example. So, our could be to find an optimal design of row for a vehicle to miss the constraint, right? So uh, these kind of problems also could be seen in other supermarket deliveries or teleportation. And well, one of our Customer that uh, uh, the department found uh, actually they expect to uh, it's they have a huge fleet of vehicles like ten thousand of vehicles and initially they expected some uh, to decrease the driving time by one percent but twenty five percent of driving time. Uh, okay, so I stopped at uh, the, so the, this company, uh, was talking about, uh, uh one of the customer. So, uh, in real life, they reduced uh, the driving time by 25%. And that leads to, uh, decreasing in, um, emission, CO2 emission by 10 million kilograms per year. And, uh, they saving money each year. They saving one hundred million dollars each year now, so it's pretty much impressive, right? So uh, it, it feels really good and motivates a lot uh, to create the better planning, right? But when engineering uh, engineers um, start to solve the, those problems, they hit uh, the scaling uh, scalability limits. They hit uh, the um, uh, optimization of grid limits and uh, code uh, uh, reu uh, reusage of code limits. So today we are going to discuss how to overcome those problems. Uh, so um, we will take a um, full timetabling problem and we will solve it by using different algorithms and uh, by using OptiPlanner as well. And we will see if it's any good. Okay. So, what is a school timetabling problem? School timetabling problem is when we have um, a set of lessons, like math taught by uh, Alan Turing for ninth grade, chemistry taught by Maria Curie for ninth grade, 
range taught by Marie Curie as well but for the 10th grade, and history taught by Indiana Jones uh, by, uh, for the 10th grade. Uh, you could notice that some of the lessons have the same students, some of them have same teachers. So instead of that, we have uh, time slots and the rooms. And we want to send these um, data as an input to our application. And we want to receive, or well, we want to create, um, what we want to create is to, uh, and to have each and every lesson assigned. All right? So you might be asking, what is the deal? It's not that hard, right? What could go, go wrong? What is our um, limitation, right? Okay. Let's try to solve it together. Let's consider uh, consider proposal A. So you could see here French and math, chemistry and history, and you could guess that it's not going to work, this solution, because, well, every lesson is assigned, but the French and math is assigned to be uh, taught by uh, at the same room at the same time. Well, it's not going to work, right? but it illustrates uh, uh, us a uh, room conflict. So let's fix it and go for propose proposal B. In, in the proposal B, uh, we have each and every lesson assigned, but you could probably notice that there is a problem here. And if we will go for the uh, teacher's view, we will see that uh, chemistry and French is being taught by Marie Curie, the same teacher, at the same time in different rooms. <laughs> it's just not going to work, right? So uh, this is so-called teacher conflict. Uh, okay, let's consider another proposal. Let's just switch chemistry and history and see what uh, will uh, what it will bring us. Okay. Um, well. Um, here, oh, we don't have teacher conflict, we don't have room conflict. Math and chemistry, as you could guess, um, they have been taught for uh, ninth grades. Well, the ninth grade, well, one mm, student group could not participate in different rooms at the same time. They want to learn something, right? So, um, uh, so it uh, it's also constrained brokerage, and it will cause uh, student group conflict. So we want to avoid it as well, right? All right, what we uh, left is the proposal D. So the math, French, chemistry, and history in this case, they don't have uh, room conflicts, they don't have teacher conflicts, or the student conflicts. So this is the feasible solution. This is the feasible solution. And we want to be able to find it. So the, um, what we're going to do is to we will create a web app. Uh, uh, so we will be able by pushing the solve button uh, receive the timetable uh, without any constraint uh, broken with this score as uh, as less as possible. Mm, I mean the score zero and. Uh, what about architecture of, uh, of our application? So we will build the application with the Quarkus. Uh, we will expose uh, time, time slots and lessons uh, via REST service, and we will send JSON to our um, simple JavaScript UI and UI client. And uh, then uh, after the calculation, uh, we will save the results in the relational database, um, just to have uh, a database as a source of truth, as probably you would like to keep it in your production environment. And um, what about the domain model? Uh, in, in the domain model, we will have time slot that will contain day of week, uh, like Monday, Wednesday, etc. start time and end time, um, like 8.30 and 9.30, the rooms, like room A and room B, and uh, lessons, of course, uh, with a name like math and chemistry, the teach with the teacher like Marie Curie, and like a st with a student group like ninth grade uh, and ten um, uh, and ten grade. Uh, and also we'll have the uh, time slots and rooms uh, variables in the lesson, and we will somehow change them. And initially we want them to be null, 
and after the calculation will be done, we want uh, all of them to be initialized by some volume. Okay, we have uh, talked about architecture, we have talked about domain model, but how are we going to evaluate our solution? Like, we, uh, when we, were we will receive and create some timetable, uh, how do we mm, will know if it's better, on, if it's uh, good or not? So, uh, we need to write some function for that, um, uh, that will calculate a score for us. So the score calculation fu function would look like this. It will uh, get as an input the state of the timetable, uh, and then um, for each and every, it will compare to each and every each pairs of lessons, and it will check if uh, it uh, if they will have uh, the same rooms uh, or the same teacher or the same student group. Uh, then the um, each is, each of uh, of such a conflicts. Uh, we will reduce by each of such conflicts. We will reduce hard score uh, by one, and then we just will return it. Okay, we now know how to evaluate the solution. But how do we search for a new solution? Uh, one way is to use a greedy algorithm. And the greedy algorithm uh, uh, works pre uh, well, well, will work for our problem like this. So we will pick up the first lesson, uh, well, for example, math. We will assign it to, ev uh, to each and every slot, and calculate the uh, calculate the uh, score. In the in this case, uh, it doesn't matter. We will pick the first one because well, uh, uh, it doesn't break any constraint right now. Uh, at the next step, we will fix the math at the place uh, where it is, and then. We will try to put history somewhere. So uh, this solution will bring us a room conflict, obviously. Uh, the next solution will work for us. So math uh, and history don't have uh, common uh, student groups or teachers. Okay, picking it up. Uh, what's next? Next, we need to assign chemistry. Okay. Uh, we cannot uh, put it uh, at the same room with math, uh, the same room uh, with history as well. So we will put it here, and we will not have any conflicts because, mm, well, we, only math and chemistry have the same students, but they will will be taught in different uh, time slots. So it's fine. All right, we're picking this, and well, for the last, the French lesson. Uh, we uh, we don't have a lot of options left. We have only one empty slot, so we will pick this solution, right? So everything is fine. Each time we're just picking up the best solution, it should be okay, right? <laughs> Wrong. So the problem here is that uh, we have uh, a teacher conflict here. Uh, chemistry and French have the same teacher, Marie Curie. And despite the fact that we have been choosing each step the best solution, we that didn't came to the global optimal. So, um, and the worst part is that <laughs> we were not able to get to this optimal solution even from the second step from here. Uh, so, after the second step, there was no way to reach this uh, to to reach the optimal solution. All right, okay, this is in theory. Let's see what uh, what's going on in practice. So we will implement greedy code like this. So uh, for each lesson, we will manipulate with time, slot, and room. We will calculate the score for each of them by using our calculate score function. And if it is any better, then we will um, accept those time slots and room and uh, save the score. Um, all right. That's Jerry. So let's go and try it. So I, uh, our application is uh, here in greedy timetabling. So you could uh, you could see here uh, we have this uh, domain that we've been talking, uh, that I've been talking about, and uh, in the solar folder, uh, solar folder we have the calculate score function and the solve function that <coughs> search. Uh, 
readily the solution, right? Mm. All right. Okay, let me just uh, go to this. Uh, go to this folder. Mm -hmm. Do the greedy time tabling, and I will run it uh, in the development mode, for development mode, so I can easily update uh, it, uh, changing <coughs> configuration. <coughs> All right, we have our four lessons uninitialized here. And uh, let me just solve it. All right, we can see that we have score minus one. And uh, we have some timetable. But the problem is, sorry. <clears throat> but the problem is that we have a teacher complete here, as we discussed before. So, um, <clears throat> so the greedy algorithm is pretty fast, but it it is not guaranteed to uh, that it will find uh, an optimal solution for us, unfortunately. So what can we try? We can try brute force, right? What could go wrong? Uh, all right, now we have school time tabling with brute force, so we will pick up the um, one lesson and assign it at every possible position. <laughs> and for every possible position, we will try uh, history for each and every possible position and chemist chemistry and French as well. And we somehow, well, by this exhaustive search, we guarantee to find feasible solution, right? So the brute force in the code will look, look like this. There are lots of nested for loops, uh, as you could see. And well, let me just demonstrate what will happen, right? So I will interrupt uh, this greedy time tabling. Uh, so we can go for uh, brute force and run it. So brute force uh, is pretty much the same as we uh, as greedy timetabling, except that in solver we have the implementation, inner implementation of solve function. So let's go for the local host, and uh, so we have four lessons here. Let me, I just let me just hit the solve button. So there is no <coughs> constraints broken. We could check it by different views. It's totally fine. <coughs> we are done, right? <laughs> Let's use uh, brute force. Oh, always. <coughs> well, actually, no. Actually, if um, Let's just try something more real. Like, let's add, mm, let's see how it's going to work with 20 lessons. <clears throat> All right, we have 20 lessons uninitialized. And let's run it. All right. Interesting, right? Uh, we don't have any errors in our application. What's going wrong? What, what is going on? <laughs> yeah. What's going on is that, well, our application is working, <laughs> but it's just needed time. Uh, well, let's calculate how much time uh, it will take, okay? Has to be sure. <clears throat> so, um, going back to this um, uh, diagram, we will see that brute force uh, on the first step will Page four nodes. On the second, 16 nodes. For, for, for the three, 64 nodes. And for you remember that for each of the nodes, we need to recalculate uh, score at least. And it could be different set of score. And here, uh, at the end, for only for four lessons, we will have two, uh, 256 nodes. Okay, all right, but how, what is the dynamic? 
So what is the search space for n lessons? The search space for n lessons, you could guess, it's n in the power of n. And so search space for 100 lessons, which is uh, well, a common case for schools, it, it would be 10 in the power of 1040. So you could wonder how big this number could be, but well, Surprise, surprise, but the amount of atoms in the observable universe is even less. It's 10 in the power of 8. That's quite big, right? All right, it's a big number uh, of um, calculations, but how much time it will take? All right. So for four lessons, it will take 8 milliseconds. For five, 0 0.1 second. For six, two seconds. For seven, 170 seconds. For eight, one hour. For nine, one day. For ten, one month. For thirteen, two hundred years. When Voyager first will pass nearby star. Or for fifteen lesson, it will be two million years. It's when Apollo footprint will fade. Or for seventy lessons, it would be five billion years. This, that's when sun will die. We will probably no need need timetable uh, in this time, okay? <laughs> right? Yeah. That's horrible, horrible. So um, I think we will not wait that that much, and we can't kill the application right now. And okay, we uh, we have seen that uh, brute force uh, could find an optimal solution, but this uh, does not scale much. So what we're going to do, we're going to use some advanced algorithms. By advanced algorithms, you could, uh, uh, you could understand local search, for example, uh, local search kind of meta heuristics. And um, we'll cheat a bit. So for local search, we need uh, to have some pre-initialized solution. So we will use the um, greedy algorithm and after that, do some uh, magic, <laughs> right? Okay, so we will use the, the we have seen that the greedy um, algorithm was uh, passed, but uh, it was not able to find the optimal solution. And uh, what we, <clears throat> and um, in the end, it provides us uh, this kind of solution, right? We still have chemistry and French code by the same teacher. All right, and what uh, lo <clears throat> local search will do, it will move some of the lessons uh, and mm, evaluate the solutions. Um, because uh, you see, uh, even if we will change, mm, we don't, we need several steps to achieve the optimal solution. We cannot just uh, switch between chemistry and French. <clears throat> it will still a uh, teacher conflict, right? So we need to um, do several steps. Uh, so, for example, and a uh, local search algorithm will pick one of the move, and move is something you could configure uh, in OptoPlanner. And um, uh, at the next step, uh, you could see that uh, it will find the, it will do the same, basically uh, switching the lessons uh, to, uh, to other places. And you will reach the optimal solution by this way. So instead of local search, there are many uh, many more meta heuristic like Lehita said, there's hill climbing, <clears throat> and all uh, all of those that you can see is implemented in OptoPlanner. So instead of that, OptoPlanner is open source project. It has Apache license, so you are free to use it in your projects. And <clears throat> let me uh, tell you a bit about compatibility. So of the planner written in Java, so, uh, uh, but we have some of the uh, quick starts with, with uh, written in Kotlin. <clears throat> also, you could use of planner in plain Java or in Quarkus by using Quarkus extension or in Spring. 
Also, um, object planner uses uh, Maven um, script uh, for building, and uh, some of the examples uh, contain Gradle scripts as well. If you use a Python, uh, there is an OctoPy library that you could use by uh, pip installing it. And also, since it is a Java <coughs> application, you could use it on different rating systems and in cloud. So, okay, we are going to use OctoPlanner, right? Uh, so, how uh, our architecture is going to be changed? Mm. Not that much. So uh, if we were using Quarkus application, we just need to add OptoPlanner extension. So go to Quarkus IO and download it. And uh, but how does uh, how will our domain model uh, change? Because we need to tell somehow to uh, OptoPlanner that we need to change uh, time slot and room, for example, uh, right? So for that reason, we need to <clears throat> add uh, plan variable annotations for time slot and room. And we need to add a planning entity annotation for the lesson class to uh, let a plan planner know that vari variables are inside this class. Actually. All right. Um, next, what we need to do is to uh, tell the planner how to evaluate uh, the solution. And the easiest way how to do that is to implement easy score calculator. So here you could see the easy score calculator implementation is not that different from the function that we uh, have been providing before, uh, except that uh, now we uh, return not integer but hard stop score. Uh, it's just a wrapper to keep two score, two kind of scores hard and soft together. Mm. Right? Okay. So let's try that. Uh, let's try the easy score calculator. So I will prepare the environment. Uh, I need to switch to another. Range. Mm. And I would like to reset it. To be sure. All right. And uh, let's go for the uh, another pro uh, project of planner timetabling and build it from there. So while it's building, you could see here um, the domain had changed a bit. We added the uh, annotation we've been talking about, planning entity and planning variables. Also, uh, in the solar folder, we have our uh, easy score calculator uh, implementation. How to score the how to score the solutions? So we have our application prepared. Well, okay, for consistency, we can solve for four lessons. It's okay. We don't have any <clears throat> score broken, any constraint broken. All right, but it's not that interesting, right? Uh, we've been um, thinking about just, I don't know, one, uh, maybe 20 lessons. Right, let's try it. So I'm in Quarkus development mode, that's why I can uh, just update, uh, the, um, update the UI or browser. So you could see there, uh, here is a 20 unassigned lessons, and let me just build it. Okay, score is zero. We don't have any constraints broken. You can see no conflicts in teachers or students. Everyone is happy. Now, what about 100 lessons? Will it make it? What do you think? Um, so, uh, we have 100 lessons unassigned. We will assign it. And I hope it will not that long as a brute force. Okay. <clears throat> we don't need to wait uh, till the sun dies. So uh, it, it, uh, it managed to solve the uh, timetable and we don't have any um, conflicts here as well for 100. Still, 
uh, you could notice that it was quite alone. Why? Well, the reason is um, we could we could see it's uh, it took uh, five seconds seconds and why I could tell you that the problem exactly in easy score calculator function it's not it's um, it's not, it doesn't scale well um, to improve that we can actually use hashing but uh, uh, much more gain. Uh, would be if we will use incremental score calculation. Incremental score calculation is uh, is when you don't need to recalculate each and every lesson, uh, but only those lessons that was moved, that was changed. And for example, here you could see that um, in this state, uh, the type table ha has two conflicts. So uh, conflict in uh, uh, student group number one uh, between math and chemistry and uh, number two between French and history for the 10th grade. And if we, uh, if we are using the uh, easy score calculator, mm, well, first we switch between French and chemistry and uh, we recalculate the score for uh, math, French, chemistry and history. Score is zero, it's fine. But if we will use incremental score calculation, uh, we'll just reuse the previous uh, volume, like minus two, and then um, OptoPlanner will uh, will recalculate the data what to decide what have changed uh, exactly in the timetable, and uh, it will. Uh, just do like this. Uh, look, we uh, uh, we moved French from this position to this position. Now it doesn't have any constraint broken, so we need to plus one, right? Uh, and then um, we we are moving uh, chemistry as well um, uh, from this position to this position, so plus one again. So the score is zero. That's more or less how incremental score is working. Um, and uh, besides that, uh, OptoPlanner provides a constraints, um, constraint provider API, which is a form of um, a functional form of uh, constraints, uh, which is easy to, mm, to write, uh, debug, and test. Uh, as you can see, the, the, this is the example. Uh, so uh, let's consider a room constraint. A room constraint, uh, again, is when you have this state of timetable, uh, when, for example, French and math ha have the same room at the same time. And French and math lesson did here. And uh, how and uh, how to tell the problem that we don't want this? Uh, we just uh, can use for each and join function to join a set of lessons with itself, and we will extract only those lessons that have equal room and time slot, right? We will have this solution, and we will penalize this. <clears throat> we will penalize this timetable by one heart, one heart uh, score. Mm. This is it. Okay, let's go for the demo. Uh, let me switch to another branch. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's from it, and I will rebuild uh, the project of the plotter timetabling. And now, Instead of easy score calculation function in the solver, we will have timetable constraint provider that implements constraint provider class with define a constraints function where we uh, just list our constraints. For example, the room conflict, which we've been talking about, uh, it's um, pretty much the same except that we here use for each unique pair because no, we want to avoid uh, we want to avoid comparing and decreasing the score because 
um, of the same because we uh, comparing the same lessons, for example, math and math. Uh, and uh, this for each unique pair is just a syntax is sugar uh, on uh, for each uh, filter duplicates. And um, the teacher's conflict is described pretty much the same. Short, sure, you could see it's simple. Um, we just uh, will penalize the solution uh, uh, lessons that uh, will have um, the same teacher at the same time slot. And uh, for the student group conflict. It's pretty much the same. Penalize the student, uh, the lesson if it's a uh, solution. Sorry, if uh, if uh, the lesson have uh, if lessons have the same student group at the same time slot. All right. Uh, so let's see if it's any good. Right. So yeah. All right. For consistency, for lessons again. Uh, all right. Uh, we don't have any constraint broken. Good, but uh, let me just try uh, the same, but with 100 lessons. How will we improve in the performance mean? 100 lessons. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, okay. Just hitting the solve button. All right. It's it looks better. Mm, we don't have uh, constraint broken here. Mm, nor, nor in room, nor by room or by teacher, or even by student group. And let's see how fast, um, how much does it take. So you could see here that uh, that with constraint streams, it took us ten times less time to create a new timetable. And so it's. Quite impressive, right? So um, let's go back to the uh, presentation. So Opti Planner is fast and scalable, near optimal. We have seen that. And um, please uh, uh, try it uh, if you're interested. Try it by yourself. Just call on the repository and uh, build the application in the Quarkus Dev uh, mode or as you wish. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm free to ask you. We do have questions, Anna. Um, thanks for the presentation. So Will asks um, that, well, he states that they're looking to integrate OptiPy into their Python project. Are there any feature limitations to be aware of uh, compared to the full uh, Java run engine OptiPlanner? Is it maintained with the same level of involvement as the main project? Well, uh, hmm. yeah, that's uh, um, hmm. well. The the, per the first difference would be in time uh, because uh, well. Java version of OptiPlanner is still works faster, unfortunately. But uh, we do uh, good improvements recently. We did a good improvements uh, recently in this direction. So that's um, that's maybe the major difference. Okay. All right. Great. Um, Adam asks, how can the inputs to OptiPlanner model scale? To millions or even billions of permutations. Hmm. For millions or billions, how could what scale? Sorry. Um, he's he's asking how can the model scale to millions and billions of permutations? All right. Yeah. I see. So millions and billions of permutation. It's a good question. And um, well, you could uh, uh, reconfigure the moves, for example, so you don't need to mm, like mm, go through each and every, well, go through lots of combinations of the data. You could reconfigure, you certainly need to try different algorithms for the scale, scaling, and you could use uh, Optoplan benchmark for that to calculate or to see the dynamics and choose the best uh, 
combination of uh, algorithms and configurations. Okay, thank you. And Narav asks, can can we use commercial solvers like Cplex or OR tools? Uh, can we use it? Sorry, I, I I didn't hear it, the, the the beginning of the question. Well, can can I'm assuming the question is can OctaPlanner use commercial solvers? Like commercial. Cplex? Yeah. Commercial and what? Solvers. Solvers, okay. Uh, commercial solvers. Mm -hmm. I, <laughs> okay, I, uh, why, like, if you want to connect, we, well, I definitely you could, so, um, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't, uh, it, it, it's kind of strange questions it could be very complicated to do that and uh, it's I, I it's probably not worth that okay sounds like something to bring up to the rest of the community and see if that's even possible um mm -hmm. let's see we have time for one more question um and that will be so um is the solution deterministic with the solvers that OptiPlanner has? No, oh, that's, that's a good one. Yes, it is. So, uh, but you could, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it depends on your configuration, actually. You could configure it to use, um, to use the algorithms without, uh, um, without it or with. That's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, great. And and thank you all very much for your questions and your time and attention. That's all we have time for today on Community Central. Anna, thank you so much for your presentation and, and walking us through how OptiPlanner works. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for your attention. All right, and with that, we close out another edition of Community Central. Um, stay tuned for more um, looks at community projects and open source technology advances. Um, until then, be safe, be well, and have an excellent day. Bye-bye.